This is the Bigger Pockets Podcast Show 405. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What is going on, everyone? It's Brandon Turner, host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, the weekend edition, here with David Green. What's up, David? Welcome back to the show. How you doing, man? Thank you, thank you, thank you. This was a blast. I'm feeling really good. I think our audience is going to feel really good too, and I'm doing great. Thanks for asking, Brandon. It's very oh, nice. Oh, good. Oh, well, good. Yeah, we just got finished recording with Mr. Lewis Howes. Uh, Lewis is a, a super successful, legit like podcaster, uh, entrepreneur, business owner. Done a lot of really, really great things. I mean, he's actually a professional football player, uh, all American in two sports in college. US, um, USA men's national handball team athlete. Uh, he's got a show called The School of Great. Greatness. I think he has over 250 million downloads on that uh, with a oh, thousand episodes. He's been on the Ellen show, the Today show, and a lot of other major uh, shows. Really like legit successful guy. Uh, and we are really excited to have, you know be able to interview him today and bring him to you guys. So uh, with that said, let's get right into things with today's quick tip. tip. All right. So one thing that Lewis talks about today, you'll hear, uh, is social media, a little bit about social media and building a personal brand. Now for real estate investors or for anybody, this is so vital because people will check you out on social media. So they're very quick. The quick tip is very simple. Go to all your social media platforms, whether it's LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, TikTok, and ask yourself like, am I portraying the person that I want the world to see? Like that I want the world to see. So that I mean, do I look professional enough? Am I am I putting out my goals there? Am I showing that I'm able to help others? Like is what I'm portraying line up with my mission? And that'll make more sense later as we get into today's show. But uh, that's your quick tip today is just take a, a five minutes to look at all your social channels and make sure uh, that it's the way you want it to look. And if not, make some changes. Anything you want to add on that, David? Yeah, our guest talks a lot about things that we're afraid of kind of dictating the decisions that we make in life. And he gives some amazing advice for purposely facing the thing you're afraid of. And I would just add on to the quick tip. There may be things that we put about ourselves to portray ourselves on social media that are directly related to our fears. I don't think I'm successful enough. I want to look more successful than I am, right? Ask yourself if social media is something that you're using to fuel your fears as opposed to fuel your goals and make those corrections. You won't regret it. It's time to get to this interview. Uh, like I said, Lewis House is somebody that I look up to a lot online. Uh, he talks a lot about how to build relationships, how to reach out, including a formula for getting someone to respond to you on social media. Uh, he talks about the three words that you should be using for any kind of upgrade, uh, whether you're at a restaurant or a hotel or an airline, how to do that. We'll talk about like creating a one life or sorry, a one sentence mission statement for like your business and for your life. Uh, we talk a lot about like insecurities and how to overcome them uh, and how to even use them and harness them for greater success in life and so much more. There's just so much gold in this episode. You guys are going to love it. So grab a pen and paper, take some notes and let's get into this thing. All right, Mr. Lewis Howes, welcome to the show, man. It's good to have you here. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you're somebody I've been watching for years, you know, grow your 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 brand, your business, your podcast. Uh, really been impressed with what you've been doing. Uh, but today I want to go, I want to introduce you to our audience. Our audience might, you know, they're not as much in the, in the necessarily internet marketing or entrepreneurship space or even in the business or personal development. There are a lot of real estate investors. So for those who don't know you, I want to I introduce you because you're a, you know, admirable guy. So can you kind of walk us through, I mean, a little bit of your early story? I mean, like what was kind of your background and how did you get into this kind of world of, uh, uh, I guess on you know just life. Sixty second uh, point of view. I grew up in a small town in Ohio called Delaware, Ohio, about an hour from uh, Columbus, and had a big dream to be an athlete, be a pro athlete. Was a two sport All American at college, and then went on to play ar arena football, making two hundred fifty dollars a week. Got injured as I was trying to make my way up to the NFL. That was kind of the the ranks getting up there. I realized that. It was like the greatest feeling of my life for that year and a half playing football, even if I was only making 250 bucks, because it was like, I'm doing something I love. I'm catching a football, I'm playing a sport that I've always dreamed to play, and I'm making money. I would have done it for free, but it was nice to make 250 bucks. I, I wish I was making more, because I didn't have any savings after I uh, got injured, and so I ended up moving in with my sister for a year and a half in Columbus, Ohio, living on her couch, 
trying to figure out at 24 what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Now that my identity is over, what can I do to make money? I never thought I would be an entrepreneur. I had zero skills or talents of selling anything. I never had a lemonade stand or sold baseball cards or I had no hustles in school growing up. Uh, I just wanted to be an athlete. And so when that identity was over, I was truly like, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? I have no transferable skills. I didn't graduate yet from college. I still had some credits that I was shy. So I was like, who's going to hire me? This was in 2007, 8, and 9 during the last economic downturn. I was like, who would hire a college dropout who made 250 bucks a, a week playing arena football? No one. They weren't hiring people with business degrees, let alone or masters, let alone people that didn't graduate college in 2008. And so I said to myself, what can I do where I understand uh, how to live life in the next phase? And I said, I only know sports, so I need to make my life like it is a sport. And what does all great athletes have? They have great coaches, they have great teams, and they are able to set goals. And if I can figure out how to do that in the next phase, then I think hopefully I'll be all right. So I started reaching out to mentors really quickly. They started giving me advice. One of them said, why don't you check out LinkedIn? Another one said, you need to overcome your fear of public speaking if you want to communicate and do well in business or at a job. So those two mentors really guided me. I started taking public speaking class every week at Toastmasters for the next year to overcome that fear. Uh, I started building my network and relationships on LinkedIn for about six hours a day during that year and a half with my sister. And I just said, I'm going to learn. I'm going to find other great people, see what they've done well, and I start taking action on my goals. Started doing kind of the online marketing stuff because I had a laptop in my sister's place. And I got into marketing quickly. I just started studying every book and interview and blog and started creating things, built an online marketing courses, sold that company, made some money in a couple of years. And then I said, okay, what do I want to do? I really want to sit down and interview people, the world's greatest athletes, minds, business leaders, and, and tell their stories. And so that's kind of what my last seven and a half years has been with the School of Greatness. Yeah, I mean, you got you got a phenomenal show, and you you talk to a lot of really really high level people, like really top performers. Uh, do you do you find certain? And this is a broad question, but certain threads that kind of tie a lot of the top performers together. Like, are there things that you're like, well, yeah, of course you're successful. I see this with almost everybody I talk to. Yeah, vision. They're unwavering in their vision of what they want. You know, the Olympic gold medalists don't just say, "I think I want to win a gold medal in the Olympics." They are so clear at a young age, and then they dedicate their life to that vision. And no one, you know, if you look at Musk or even Trump, no one's just like, oh, I think I want to do this. I think I want to start a car company. I think I want to be the president, or I think I want to build a real estate empire. Just like you guys were very clear on your real estate vision, and you went all in on it, and you obsessed about it until you mastered it. So number one, they're very clear in their vision. Number two, they all have some adversity that they need to face at some point, and usually multiple times. And they, all the greats learn to master their adversity. They don't shy back and fall backwards. They actually say, okay, how am I going to become this adversity? And essentially learn to use it as one of my skill sets as opposed to something that holds me back. And so they turn their adversity into their advantage. The third thing I would say is they all have eventually a sense of, of uh, service, something you want to do to give back. I think the ones that transcend success and turn into greatness don't make it about them. They make it about other people because success is all about us, what we accomplish, but greatness is all about what we can give to others or the world. You know, you mentioned during that awesome story there that you were staying at your sister's place. For the guests that aren't familiar with your story, can you share a little bit about what was going on in your life when you were at your sister's house and maybe how that period of time helped you develop the three things that you just mentioned right there? I mean, what was going on was a sense of depression, loneliness, insecurity, uh, poorness. I mean, I was just eating off my sister every day. I didn't have any money. And I was essentially begging people for food uh, many times. I remember going to a Toastmasters class uh, once, and they had, like, bread and cheese in the back. I don't know if you guys know what Toastmasters yeah. is, but it's like a public speaking class. They had, like, bread and cheese and crackers in the back. And I was literally – this is when I had a cast on, so I had a full arm cast from my shoulder – to my fingers in this position, kind of like rookie of the year. But <laughs> after I took the cast off six months later, I didn't have superhuman strength like that kid did in that movie. And so I was kind of in this position for six months, yeah, holding my arm <laughs> up. 
And uh, that's like my favorite movie when I was a kid, by the way. It's great, yeah. Yeah, I love But it's really frustrating to be in this position when you can't straighten your arm, you can't turn your hand, you can't do anything. And so I went into this Toastmasters class, um, and they had food in the back, and I literally was stuffing my pockets with food, like putting it in napkins, stuffing it. And this this man who gave a speech there uh, saw me doing this. He said, "What are you doing?" I go, uh, "I'm I'm really hungry. You know, I'm just like I'm a, I used to be a football player. I'm starving. I don't have any money." And he said, "Let me go buy lunch." And he bought me lunch. And I just started saying, he's like, why are you here? And he could see I was kind of down and out. This is like, I couldn't even wear a normal shirt at this time because my shirts wouldn't go over the cast. It was so big. So I had like cut off like wife beater. I just really looked out of place. Everyone in this this Toastmasters had like suits on. They were all professionals. And I was this 24-year-old kind of bum. And he said, why are you here? I said, you know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out the next stage of my life. And I need some great coaching. I need to overcome my fears. I just feel like I, I have no sense of direction. He ended up becoming another mentor, and we ended up writing a book together. So my first book I wrote a year and a half later, which was about LinkedIn, because I was spending all my time on LinkedIn. I was kind of helping him how to use it and how to meet people for his business. And he was helping me. He was like, you need to write a book about this. And I was like, I have no clue how to write a book. I could be, almost flunked out of English in high school. And he said, well, I've written four books, so why don't we write it together, and I'll guide you. And I'll tell you what you need to write, and I'll work on it. I'll get it printed. I'll you know, I'll do all that stuff. But you just write the content you know because I really built a brand around being kind of the LinkedIn expert because that's all I did. I just obsessed over learning how to use LinkedIn, kind of like you guys obsessed over how to buy and flip duplexes. I was like, LinkedIn is going to be my thing because I have a laptop. I'm on my sister's couch. And I feel like this could be an opportunity to build relationships, maybe find a job or something with my life. So I just went all in on that one thing and uh, started becoming the expert around it, started branding myself as the LinkedIn guy. Everyone at that time was talking about how to use social media back in 2008, 2009. No one was talking about one platform the way that I was talking about LinkedIn. I was saying, screw all social media, just focus on this and here's the results you can get. And because I was not branding myself as a social media expert, I was branding myself as the LinkedIn guy. Opportunities started to flood in from that, you know, branding strategy. And I leveraged that. Once I broke through in one category, then I was able to break through in other categories and, and use those relationships for the next phase of my life. So I really spent that year and a half on my sister's couch learning, researching, testing things, reaching out to mentors, and just constantly seeing how can I develop new skills that maybe will be transferable and someday. I didn't know because at that point, I still wasn't really making any money. I was just trying to figure out who am I, what do I want to do, and who can help me. You know, you know, when I love that you say that idea of like you went all in on this thing rather than just be I'm a social media guy it's like I'm going to be a sp particular on this now I was listening to an interview you did with uh, Jay Shetty that's his name right Jay right so you did an interview with him uh on his show uh on purpose so it's called I want to make sure I'm getting it right and give him a shout out so I was listening to this morning while I was out for a walk and you mentioned a lot of people and I just I wrote down this point because I thought it was so good a lot of people just go way too wide way too fast uh, and you were talking about the importance of just like really like focusing in on something first. Can you can you talk about like like how that applies? Like like why that's so important? Yeah, imagine like imagine there's a wall in front of us. You're in a house and you're trying to tear down the wall, but you want to try to do everything, and so you hit the wall in every different point. And you never break through the wall. You're punching it. You can't break through the wall because you're hitting it in all different points all over the wall. And you're putting your energy spread out everywhere as opposed to I'm going to go in one direction, one focused area, and I'm going to keep punching until I break through this wall in this certain place. Once we break through the wall, we get out to the other side of the wall. Now we can open up a broader net. Now we've expanded our awareness, our capabilities, our skill sets. So on the other side, we can then start going wider. Most people start wide, uh, maybe in real estate. Like I'm going to do mm -hmm. duplexes, then I'm going to buy 10 apartments, and I'm going to buy yep. four homes in this development, and then I'm going to go all over the country as opposed to 
let me just focus on apartments in Delaware, Ohio, and just start with 10 there and figure that out and become the best at that one thing, as opposed to, well, I'm going to get involved with this, and I'm going to do commercial real estate and this. No. Wait until you focus on the one thing, master it. Then with that skill set, that experience, that expertise, then, okay, I'm going to try these other types of real estate investments. I'm not sure if that's what you guys that's would exactly, say. That's exactly. And so, I, people need to re-listen to that last 30 seconds or a minute it, over it. It's because I think you're going to, okay, I'm going to be the expert in Twitter or, or Facebook and YouTube. We don't have that much time and energy to go all in on everything when we start out. When we build resources, when we build team, then we can spread it and go wider and kind of diversify. But I'm always telling people to go all in on the thing that you're most talented or most excited about in the beginning. And don't stop. A lot of people, this is a great ex, uh, example. Jay Shetty, since you mentioned him, I met Jay three years ago when he had 200,000 followers on his whole social media platform. And no one really knew who he was at the time. And we met literally three years ago, like this week, essentially. And um, we spent a whole day together in New York City. And after about a year, he really kind of blew up. Over the next year, he went from 200,000 around this time of the year to in January, he had 2 million followers like a few months later. Then at the end of that year, so 2018, he had 20 million followers. So it started 2019, he had 20 million followers and he's grown to 37 million now. And he, he said like in 2018, he was like, oh man, everything's growing. I want to launch a podcast. I want to do a book. I want to do an event here. I want to do all these other things now. And I said, listen, man, and this was at 2 million followers. I said, listen, this thing is blowing up faster than I've ever seen. Screw the podcast. Screw the book until you reach 10 million followers, until you reach 20 million followers. Like, go all in on this viral video creation thing. He was doing like one a week at the time. I said, you should be doing three a week until it stops growing. Like, go all in because it's working right now until it stops. Then when you see it taper off, Okay, now's the time to transfer that into the book, into the podcast, into a coaching program, which he did in the last year. And it's all worked out in a beautiful way. But if he would have started early when it was just 2 million, when things were growing, and he said, let me transfer this energy and do all these other different things, he probably wouldn't have the following he has now. And he went all in on it. So I think that's why it's important for anyone listening in real estate to go all in on the one thing. And, and focus on it. Whatever that thing is that you're excited about, that you're interested in, that you know about, go all in on it. That's so good. Because yeah, people just try to do way too much beginning. Together. And podcasts are partially to blame for it, right? Because we listen to a podcast, you're like, oh, that sounds amazing. And oh, I'm going to start that business. I better go do yeah. an Amazon business and a real estate thing. And and like, yeah, well, if you can just focus on that thing that fires you up, that you're good at, that you, that you can do, like, yeah, all in, pour into that thing. And I think, fo and say, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to take on shiny objects until I yeah. get 10 apartments, until yep. I get 30, whatever it is, the thing that yeah. you're going to do. Like, okay, make a number, and, and until this, I'm going to say no to everything else. And all my money is going to go back into the next one of these things, of this investment. Then when I hit 10, okay, I'll dabble in commercial real estate. I'll dabble in whatever else there is. I'll dabble in that and see if I like it. But I feel like you got to make the bread and butter the bread and butter until you've maxed it out or until you've got so much extra resources, time, or team to go try the next thing. But it's just tough, man. Well, let's unpack that a little bit. Let's talk about why it's hard to do that. Because I know when you don't have much, when you're sleeping on your sister's couch, uh, like anything sounds good. When you are hungry, you're not picky about what man. you eat, right? So <laughs> it can go from I'm starving to there is a buffet in front of me yes. and we're telling them, no, you got to focus on just the vegetables. You can't go eat all that junk right now. And it's hard to tell yourself no when you've been hungry for this long. Can you maybe yeah. explain how you were able to have the discipline to focus on that one thing when you're like, oh, it's all there. I got to go grab everything. I may never get another chance. Yeah. When I was 24, I, I, I was like, I'm going to focus. Once I realized that LinkedIn was a, a way for me to make money, someone paid me $100 when I was kind of doing a LinkedIn profile makeover review for them. And I go, what? You'll pay me for this? And I was like, huh, let me try to find more people that would do this. I kept doing that. 
and I kept charging more. Then I was like, okay, I'm going to do LinkedIn networking events because everyone's trying to find a job and find business opportunities. So I did 20 networking events using LinkedIn to bring people together in person back in 2008, 2009. Then I was like, let me go deeper. Let me write a book about LinkedIn. Let me do webinars about LinkedIn. Let me create a course about LinkedIn. I just said, I'm going to do everything on this topic. Then as I started stacking cash and realizing I'm not going to be hungry anymore, I was like, okay, now I can try the next thing. And what I would say to everyone here is, and what I do now for myself, because I have an, a, kind of an abundance of opportunities that are all amazing that come my way, my only Achilles heel is me saying yes to too many things that will take me away from the mission. So everyone listening or watching right now, I would say if you don't have a one-sentence mission statement for your business and a one-sentence mission statement for your personal life, then you're going to be making decisions that aren't going to support you in the long run. So my one-sentence mission for my business is similar to my mission for my life. They kind of bleed together because I am a personal brand and my mission is my life. Is to inspire and impact 100 million people every single week to help them live a better life. It's my one-sentence mission. So I ask myself, when all these opportunities come in, does this serve the mission, yes or no? And if it doesn't, okay, am I willing to do this as a creative side project for fun, knowing it's going to take my time, attention, and energy away from the main mission and slowing it down? Am I okay with that? Maybe I am because it brings me fun or it's creative or it's interesting or whatever, and that's cool. But the more clear I am on my mission, the easier it is for me to say yes and no to things or to know, like, will this help me with the mission, yes or no? And so maybe someone listening is saying, I want to have $3 million in real estate investments in the next 15 years, whatever, I'm just making this up. Okay, then don't go invest in this other stupid stuff. If this is the main mission for your financial business goals, like just focus on that. And if you can ask yourself, what would it take to do this in half the time? If my life depended on it, and I had to do this in seven and a half years, what would I need to do? What would I need to shift? Better yet, if my life depended on it, I had to do it in three years, or someone's going to shoot me in the head and I'll die, could I make it happen? The answer is usually yes, you could. You just aren't having an interesting enough imagination to see an urgency to focus your energy to make it happen. And so I feel like a lot of us just aren't clear. And that's when I go back to the greatest minds. They are very clear on their vision of what they want. And they live with a sense of urgency of why they want it and getting it now. And I try to think of, okay, if this is the big goal, if my life depended on it, could I do it in half the amount of time? If so, what would need to happen? Who would I need to hire? What relationships would I need to build with distribution? Like whatever it may be, I think about the solutions, not, well, is that, is it possible? No, it doesn't matter if it's possible. If I had to, what would I need to do? And I think writing a one sentence mission statement for your business or financial goals, and then a one sentence for your life and making decisions based on your mission brings you a lot more happiness. That's so good because yeah, people will just make choices based on whatever they're. You ever read the book? You ever heard of the book Life and Air? It's like L, it's like millionaire with the word life in front of it. No, so it's a phenomenal book. I'm gonna send it to you because it's so Please. good. Yeah, uh, that's it's cool. It, yeah, it's like this book. It's it's about like the the rules that we play by in life, like in life, should be dictated by the purpose of that life, Absolutely. not like. But we play by other people's rules all the time. So like if the goal of life is to make a million dollars, you're going to play by certain rules. But if the goal of life is not to make a million dollars or a billion dollars or whatever, then what rules are we playing by? And all of a sudden it makes you just rethink like, what am I doing? Like things like you shouldn't pay off all your debt because you can, you know, if you're getting, if you pay off your mortgage at 3%, you can invest that money in the stock market and blah, blah. Like, well, yeah, that's true. If the goal of life is to get as rich as possible but assuming the goal is not that. So in other words, having that vision of like what your life's about. Um, so that, that's where the book, the title life and air, it's about having more life, not more money. It's probably one of the reasons why, listen, I'm not, a, I'm not an educated in real estate as, as much as I want to be. And it's probably one of the reasons I've been resistant to buying a home uh, because I don't want to personally, my mission is to invest in my business and my brand to impact more people. And so living in Los Angeles, the, the smallest home, a two bedroom, two bath is, you know, 3 million in, in West Hollywood. It's like, 
why put in whatever that is, 20% of that 600 or 800 grand, whatever that is, I don't know, and use all that cash when I could put that into hiring 10 people that could support the vision of my life better and invest in other things or invest in a real estate fund that's paying me a dividend every month and use that cash to support my vision. I don't want to deal with the property taxes. I don't want to deal with the headache of cleaning up the pool. I don't want to deal with fixing the the, the roof or whatever, the appliances. I don't want to deal with that stress uh, of trying to understand it. And so for me, at this point in my life, I'm not married. I don't have kids. I'm sure one day I'll want to buy my home, but I don't see the value of it based on my mission. If all I cared about was um, – something else in my life and having that security and real estate, real estate, real estate, then it, maybe it would be a priority. I think that's a really good point when you consider who you take counsel from. That It's easy to get into this binary way of thinking, are they good or are they bad? Are you a disciple of Dave Ramsey or Grant Cardone? Grant Cardone's going to say, 10 extra life, go big. Take whatever you thought you could do and multiply it by 10. Dave Ramsey's going to say, don't be stupid, be careful, play really good defense. Right. Both of them are right in the way that they are That's advising it. you for how to build your life. So if you're not clear on where you want to go, how do you know who to listen to? How do you know what coach to be taking advice from? You're just going to be stuck treading waters going in a million directions and not going anywhere. Yeah. And I was, I'm always looking at models in my life as an athlete growing up. I had models of the athletes and wide receivers that I looked up to the, the positions and the sports that I played. And I would watch how they moved, how they played, their men, their mindset. I would watch their interviews. Uh, it's the same thing with the model of the life I'm at now. I really look at, okay, what is The Rock doing? What is Oprah doing? What is LeBron James doing? I see myself as like if those three had a baby, I would. that's what I would want to be. It's like The Rock, Oprah, LeBron James. Okay, let me look at those models and see what they're all doing. They're all building their brand. They're all giving back. They're all building their own empire and whatever – lane it is and i resonate with all three of them and i feel like i try to pull from each one of them so that's that's the kind of life that i'm living yeah that's really good brandon do you have three people that you look to and you say i'd love to be like a combination of these three david green lewis house and Ke <laughs> kevin i don't know no. uh, i mean i definitely do and, but yeah because it's easy to just go i want to just be i want to be super rich like grant cardone or i want to be super famous like oprah um but I also want to look at like sometimes you see people who have an amazing life in one area and they have not such an amazing life in the other area. Right. So I want to find the people yeah, who are Oprah most well rounded. Oprah has no kids and it's not married yeah. and it's like, OK, well, yep. okay. I don't want that. But yeah. mm -hmm. maybe The Rock where he's got kids and he waited 10 years to get married is like something I could do. You know, it's like. Yeah. I'd be like The Rock. That'd be all right. Yeah. I, I, gotta, I, I can handle that. He actually probably is one of the more well-rounded people I feel like yeah. uh, out there. You uh, would be The Branch. Yeah. The branch, Not the rock. <laughs> the yeah, rock. there you go. That because I'm so foot, awkwardly tall and, of, yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Are you six six? Six five and a half. Unless I'm, I'm around a six five and a half guy. I'm, How tall I'm six, are you? I'm six four. So you're probably six four All and right. a half, right? All right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right. So uh, I want to know. So okay. So first of all, I will say this. I'm the real, I mean, I'm like the real estate guy, right? Everyone knows me like the real estate guy, but I actually agree a hundred percent that like, I think a lot of people should not invest in real estate, at least not the way that I do or David does yeah. because like their highest and best use is not that they're an amazing public speaker. They should probably be doing something with public speaking or they're amazing at writing books or at LinkedIn or whatever. So, uh, just so everyone listening understands like, just cause we talk about real estate, like doesn't mean you should necessarily do it. Hence the reason we're now doing these shows here on the weekends as well is like, Let's talk about other ways to grow success. Yeah. Uh, but then you take that money and you invest it in things that are like super, super good investments, meaning like other people. Like I think people are one of the best investments, if not like, you know, one of definitely one of the best. Uh, you also mentioned you put money in a real estate fund, like a real estate fund. So now your money's growing. So you earn it, you earn it one way and you can invest it and grow it in another way. Uh, yeah. I just and, don't want to manage it because yeah. then I want to deal with yep. the stress of it personally, because the idea of real estate excites me. The idea of managing real estate does not excite me. And even the idea of like, okay, well, I can just buy homes and have a property manager. The idea of dealing with the property manager and yeah. the logistics and stress of that, for me, yep. does not work for me personally, my, my yep. personality. But I understand that if I want to build wealth in America, I have to be involved in real estate in some way. You know, obviously, there's people that build companies and sell companies where they can generate extreme amounts of wealth. But some obviously the richest people in America are involved in real estate and they build their wealth that way. So I just don't understand the, the value of concentrating effort in my business to generate uh, wealth there in my business 
yep. but diversifying that by putting it in real estate as well. If something happened where my business crashed and I had no money or something. And that's why I think it's important to diversify in some ways, but to have a concentrated effort on one place also. Well, that's what the best systems, like let's take a professional sports team. The best coaches take things off of their players and say, you focus on this, right? When you're carrying the burden of everything, it's very hard to be good at any one thing. And I think, Lewis, what you're describing is you develop that ability to say, if I was to go make money in this area, I would lose money ultimately because I'm not able to excel at what my role is, the thing that I'm supposed to be good at. And I'm guessing your football career probably had a lot to do with, you know, you've got 11 men on a field. They're all doing a very specific thing, but they have to work in harmony. If the left tackle is thinking about what the wide receiver is supposed to be doing, how are they ever going to be good at what they do, right? It takes some trust, it takes some faith, and it takes a good system. Do you think that your background in that helps you develop this understanding of it's okay to say no to a lot of things so I can focus on my job? Yeah, I think so. I mean, as a business owner, I don't know if you have that luxury to say, you, you still have to kind of learn everything, especially when I started out. I was I was every player on the field in yes. my business because I had no money. So I'm learning how to hire people, how to mm -hmm. manage money, how to make money, how to uh, build a product, how to sell, how to design website, like everything. And I think like probably like what a coach maybe would have is like, okay, you learn enough of every position and what needs to be in place. Mm -hmm. And you can step in when you need to, to help out there. But truly it's, it's learning how to put the right people in place, which is kind of the stage I'm at now as we continue to hire more and more mm -hmm. people, how can I empower them and not, and step away from being the one who's always done it all and just say, here, I empower you. It's hard to let go of that once you've done it for a long time. But I know that in order for me to reach the next level, I need to let go of something that's been holding me back. And that's definitely one of them. Um, but I think it's, and I've been telling my COO more and more, like, I don't care what I need to invest in or how much this next hire is or whatever it is. I need to be focusing on my skills the best because that's what's going to help us accelerate the mission. And it's hard when you're the business owner because it's all your own money that you're investing back in people. And what if it doesn't work out? You just got to deal with that. It's part of the cost of doing business. But the more I can focus on my skill set that only really I can do in this business, the more successful it'll be. The more time I spend on trying to do things that I'm not the best at, the longer it'll take to get there. And that translates easily into real estate sales. If you're the guy who analyzes the deal and you're spending all your time talking to contractors and trying to manage a timeline, you're losing money. I just heard Ryan Serhant talk about this. He's a really, really big real estate agent in New York, one of the biggest in the country. And he made that exact same comment you just said. I need to focus on things only I can do. Only I can talk to the real estate developer. Only I can talk to the guy building the, the uh, skyscraper that we're going to sell the stuff. I don't have to be the only one doing paperwork. I don't have to be the only one finding lender partners. And I think that as people are building their portfolio, if they keep that in mind, I have to find the deal. I have to analyze the deal. I have to find the people that I have to bring and get other people doing the rest of it. You find success just starts to become a whole lot easier than when yeah. you're trying to do it's true. everything. You know, I want to ask you, there's a lot of talk that we could be heading into a recession and whether we are, whether we're not, there's one coming at some point, just like there's always a recovery coming. What advice do you have for people that can't stop worrying about what if it's not ideal? What if something goes wrong? Well, it's not going to be ideal. I don't think for anyone, unless you're like, I don't know, a, uh, a mask company or something like that, or <laughs> yeah, um, if you'd make N95 masks, right, exactly. you'd probably I mean, feel pretty good. There are actually some businesses that are thriving there's, during this time more than ever, but I think it's it's probably rare. Um, I just come back down to, I'm always thinking if I lost everything, what do I need to have in order to relaunch in a moment so that I wouldn't be worried about money or, or making money or anything like that? And it comes down to the quality of my relationships. It comes down to the amount of skills that I've developed for myself and continue to develop. And the third thing, it comes down to well, I would say rep relationships slash reputation I have with those relationships, like their ability to believe in me, um, skills I have. And then also uh, the third thing is, oh, man, I had it, but I can't remember what it is right now. Skills, relationships, I'll just, I'll just leave it with those two. I can't remember what the third one is. But um, I feel like if you have that and you have a personal brand, 
then you can always launch something again. You can always bounce back. Even if I even if I lost everything, I feel like I've got those three things, which I feel like I could call up one person and do a business deal with and make money. I could come up with a new product or project and launch it to my audience. Or even if I lost my audience, I could find one partner, and say, hey, can we launch this to your audience and do a 50-50 rev deal? I just feel like, oh, the, th the third thing I was going to say is my my ability to embrace my insecurities and fear. I feel like um, people are afraid that things are going to, uh, you know, their legs are going to get cut out underneath them during this next year. People are afraid. And I dealt with that fear 12 years ago when I was going after my dream. And then I got cut out during the recession. I got injured. There was no money. And I realized I could survive and make it. Now, I had no kids, no responsibilities, and I had a sister that let me live for free for a year and a half. So I had some support there, obviously, which would be different now. But I feel like this is something I'm always coaching people is every single year, I write down a list of my three biggest fears. I write down a list. And again, this is important, I think, to have a mission statement for your finances or your business career and a mission for your life. And at the top of the year, I write down what are my three biggest fears. And these are usually psychological fears, internal fears, insecurities. Not like I'm afraid of spiders, but more of like I'm afraid of people judging me when I, if I launch this project. I'm afraid to put this book out there. I'm afraid if I do my first real estate deal, I'm going to lose money. Whatever that fear is, it's usually like an inner psychological conversation that we have. In every new success or accomplishment is a different season and bigger fears and insecurities could potentially come up even if you're conquering ones from the past. And I feel like a, a lot of people aren't doing that uh, experiment on a, on a yearly basis and it hurts us because I felt like right when COVID hit, I was like, I'm prepared for this. I was like, even if I lose everything, I'm prepared because for the last 12 years, all I've been doing has been tackling my insecurities and fears, killing my ego as often as I can, humbling myself through my failures, and saving. You know, I've been saving, so it's like, okay, if everything goes to crap, I've got savings. Not everyone is starting at that place where they don't have savings, but I feel like if we're always staying ready, we don't have to get ready. That's a you know a football terminology. It's like stay ready so you don't got to get ready. And we stay ready by constantly conquering our insecurities, our fears, and our self-doubt. Challenge is most of us shy away from it because it's extremely uncomfortable to face our insecurities and self-doubt. It's really tough to face judgment, criticism, the fear of failure, the fear of success. These are all things that are hard. But when we practice them on a daily basis, I just feel like it makes you indestructible when chaos and a recession ensues. So let me let me give an example, and I'm curious of how you would address something like that. So one thing I struggled with for a long time as a, as a big fear of mine was like this fear of rejection, right? I mean, I think a lot of us struggle with it. We want to be liked. And I had, I had this, like I was going to start a real estate fund, right? So I was, I was going to do this, but I, I kept resisting it for years because I said, I don't like raising money. And when my, I, I told this on a recent podcast, and it was, I'll say it again now, is I just... I have this coach and I, he was asking me, well, why don't you want, like raising money? I was like, well, and it really came down to it when he asked me why about 10 times is because I feel like when, when people don't give me, when they say no to me, they are saying they don't like me. And like, it was a fear of rejection, right? A fear of not being liked. So how, like, you know, I worked through that and now today I have a big real estate fund, uh, you know, so I feel like I came out the other side, but how do you recommend, like, what do you do to overcome fear, to overcome the, like, once you identify what your fears are, like, how do you overcome them? How do you get through that? You ever watch Batman? I love Batman. Dark Knight. Yeah. Batman Begins. I'm, I'm a fan of those movies. You know, it's a, it's a, a cliche story, I guess, but when Bruce Wayne falls in the, uh, the well and he's afraid of the bats, he comes back later in his life and he says, I'm still afraid. I need to live in the darkness. I need to live with the bats. I need to become one with the bat and become the bat, essentially. And uh, for me, that's why I think it's important to I first identify what is my fear. So for me, you know, I'll give an example of public speaking. I could not stand up in front of a group of three, four, or five people and share a one-minute speech, a one-minute thought 
really I could only speak to people like one-on-one. But when it was a group of people, it was like I didn't know how to manage it. I felt like people were laughing at me. I felt like I wasn't interesting. I felt like they were going to talk about me behind my back. I was completely insecure with this. And when I met this mentor, he was like, you need to go to you need to go to Toastmasters every week until this is no longer a fear. Because whether you're looking for a job and you're going to be presenting something in a boardroom in a company or you want to be a professional speaker or you're going to be an entrepreneur, whatever it is, this is a skill you're going to need in any area of your life if you want to persuade people and make an impact. Because if you can't communicate your message, it's going to be truly a lot harder to make an impact. And as an athlete, I felt like I could get away with it because I never had to speak. I just had to perform on a field. And I let my actions be my words to inspire people. But I no longer had that, I guess, uh, thing to fall back on. I couldn't just perform and be an athlete and not have to say anything. If I wanted to get a job, I had to do an interview or anything. And so I remember being terrified for months in Toastmasters. But I gave myself the mission and the goal. I said, I'm going to go here every week until I'm not afraid, until I'm not sweating, until I'm not trembling, until I'm not stuttering. And for months, all those things happened until, and, I, and what I did is I was like, okay, I'm going to film myself every time. I'm going to experience extreme embarrassment and humiliation over and over and over again until it doesn't make me humiliated anymore. I would watch myself and on agonize uh, on the game film, watching back my speeches of how horrible I was, how I didn't have any vocabulary, how I couldn't look people in the eyes. And I said, okay, what's one thing I can do? a little bit better next week for my next speech. And every week I'll get a little bit better and I'll say, wow, okay, I did do this better. I improved there. I got better feedback. And I created an experiment for myself where I said, I'm going to humiliate myself over and over again until I don't feel humiliated anymore. And I think a lot of us don't put ourselves in that environment of pain, emotional pain. I did this with uh, when I was a going into my junior year in high school. I was terrified to speak to girls. I don't know if you guys were like super confident talking to girls growing up, but I had zero confidence and I wanted to be liked by girls and guys. Right. And I could not ever get the courage to go up and like talk to a girl that I was thought was cute or attracted to. So going to my junior year, I said, okay, enough is enough. I'm sick and tired of feeling like so insecure all the time. So for one summer, I gave myself an experiment. I said every single day, When I see a girl that I'm attracted to or I get butterflies, when I see them, I'm going to walk right up to them and I'm going to have a conversation. For the first two weeks, it was horrifying how embarrassed I was. (laughs) So bad because I'm just like, "Uh, my name's Lewis, I'm stuttering. I have no clue what I'm saying. I have zero skills. I have zero confidence. And girls would laugh at me. Girls would run away from me. It was like horrifying. Everything you don't want to happen as a young boy happened in the way you don't want it. And I just said, I'm going to keep committing to this and I'm going to try a little bit better the next time. And I'm just trying to figure out what works. And by the end of the summer, I swear to you, I'm having the time of my life. I'm talking to, you know, I'm 15 or 16. I'm talking to 40 year old women just to like experiment. Like, okay, I'm just going to say hi to them. I'm not trying to pick any girls up. I'm just want to overcome this fear. And every year I do this, I write down my fears and I go all in on them until they become a strength, until until it becomes something that I really feel like I'm good at or not afraid of anymore. And so it's it's identifying it and then saying, okay, I'm going to go all in and experience the rejection over and over. Like you should say, okay, I'm going to ask 10 people that I really respect and I'm going to experience them saying no, rejecting me, laughing at me, saying, nah, it's not right. It's not good enough. And then saying thank you for the feedback because they're going to tell you what they need in order to invest in your fund. And you can say, okay, what would my fund need to look like in order for you to give me a million dollars? What would it need to have for you to feel like it's it's worthy of your time? What would I need to be creating for you in order to, to trust me more? And then you can get amazing feedback. So everything I do is just getting feedback through the humiliation but a lot of us never want to experience that failure or humiliation because it's so painful. It sucks. I don't like it, but I know it's necessary to get what I want. Yeah, that's powerful stuff. Yeah, just the idea of like identifying what that fear is and then trying to embrace that is like I'm going to improve that. It's intentionally trying to change your life. It's so hard. Sitting in the back seat. Yeah, it's, it's so hard. hard. I did the same thing. 
another quick story. I mean, every year I do this. Uh, I did this with salsa dancing. I mm. went to a salsa club one time when I was 20, I don't know, 20, 23, 24, right around this time I was on my sister's couch. And um, I was mesmerized, mesmerized by, it was all Latinos. I was the only white guy. Imagine being uh, 6'4 in a, a salsa club with all like 5'5 five, no. five Latinos, right? <laughs> and I stand out like a sore thumb and I would go there every week once a week for months and just watch in the corner, never dance because I was so scared. But I wanted to learn how to salsa dance, but I just didn't want to embarrass myself because everyone was so amazing. And eventually one girl dragged me out. This is after months of resisting and never going to dance, but I would be there to watch. She drags me out and I literally am sweating. I'm so humiliated. She's teaching me the basic steps and I'm like, everyone is laughing at me. Everyone thinks I'm an idiot. I don't even know what I'm doing. I can't understand this. I'm stepping on her. After about 10 minutes, I look up. No one cares. No one's looking at me. No one's laughing at me. If anything, they're like, yeah, great job. Like, keep it up. Like, come back. They were encouraging. And it's what made me say, okay, I'm going all in on this. And I obsessed over salsa dancing every day for the next three and a half months, taking group classes, taking private lessons, studying on YouTube, practicing in the mirror until... I wasn't afraid of it anymore. And now I travel the world, or I did before COVID, travel the world to the biggest cities in the world, and I'll go anywhere where people don't speak the language. I can walk right up to any club to the best dancer in the club and dance with confidence and ease because I allowed myself to feel humiliation for months. That's the Batman story or you know, moral that, he faced those bats. There's a scene where he's standing in the cave and they're all running right by him. And, you know, he's, he's terrified, just, but he's yeah. making himself and he actually harnessed it. Yeah. And the whole, the Batman idea is that he now uses that same fear against his enemies. Yeah. And you were able to harness your fear of the dancing and the talking to women. And now you use that for the business that you exactly. build. You make a living talking to people and all kinds of different people. And, and I never imagined I'd be able to do this, but it was like, I embraced it. And that's the awesome part about when you do something that emotionally difficult that I can just imagine as you were talking, watching you in that salsa studio, sweating and terrified. Sweating. Just the We're using words like I was scared, but that doesn't really do justice to the emotion that you're no, actually feeling. Trembling. When, <laughs> yes. Right. And the price you paid was that you faced it. And the reward is now this career and this brand that you've built. And that's just why it's so worth pursuing because you don't know how amazing it's going to be on the exactly. other side. And Brandon, probably for you, you, you know, you were afraid. I don't know how long you were thinking about launching this fund or how many years, you, how many years were you thinking about it? Yeah. At least, at least probably five years of me thinking I should take this to the next level wow. and not doing it. Yeah. And and you probably did you get some rejections when you finally started asking people? Uh, I asked two of my good friends and they rejected me. That stopped me for like two more years because I asked two friends. They said no. And you were like, and, okay, uh, if my two friends yeah. won't invest in me, then yeah. why? How am I going to reach out to strangers that I barely know? I found out later they just didn't have any money. Of course, exactly. I just didn't think, I, yeah, that's the it thing. Was ridiculous. And but the yep. more you experienced it, and you got more comfortable with it, and, and I'm sure you started asking people, yeah. and people said yes, and then some people said no, and you're like, okay, I'll just keep yeah. asking. It's almost a numbers game more than anything now, which is, it is interesting. The other thing I find interesting with the insecurity and the fear thing, and, and I've shared this on the podcast before, but you know, like my biggest insecurity in life, my biggest insecurity has always been my voice. Ever since I was a kid, I have a lisp, and I was in speech therapy, and like I've always struggled with it. And isn't it ironic sometimes? It's like the Batman thing, right? Like the thing that I am most ashamed about in my life is the thing that I am being used the the widest, you know, yeah, like I, public funny, speaking right? terrified me and, and then talking in front of people. So I didn't even know you had a list, but I couldn't even hear it. Okay, I work on it. But there it's like, I, I have a lazy talking and uh, yeah, it's, just, it's ironic that like that, that stuff sometimes works that way yeah. when you lean into it. Like the first, do, do you want a podcast? No way. I would never do a podcast. That'd right. be ridiculous. Exactly. But you lean into it. The, I, one, think by, one more, I think people are more inspired by those that have some adversity or challenge and and they, they keep doing it in spite of their adversity. Yeah. So even if you're like, hey, guys, I'm really nervous on this first podcast and I, you know, I'm insecure because I got a lisp or whatever, and I've never been on radio, I don't know what I'm doing, but God, I'm so excited about to teach you about real estate because it's transformed my life. And I feel yeah. like I'm doing a disservice by not overcoming this and just sharing it with you. People are more inspired the fact that you're not this super confident speaker, that you don't have this training, but you have a wisdom that you want to share, and that's what they get excited about. 
Yeah. That's actually, I think that the huge part of it is like the heart at which you teach that stuff, the yeah. heart at which you do that stuff. Yeah. I, I feel the same way. I go to jujitsu now. Uh, we had a uh, Jocko Willink on the show yeah, and he, he's you know, great. challenged me to, yeah, he's great. Challenged me to go out and do it. So I go the next day. It was the most painfully embarrassing, awkward. Like just, I didn't even, I didn't even get on the mat. I just stood there like an idiot in the wall, you know? And I still feel like that every time I show up yeah. every time, but I'm going to keep showing up. It's the same thing. Cause I'm like, eventually I'll be good at this. Exactly. Or I'll figure it out. Exactly. You know? I beat a 75 pound, like 60 year old lady last time. Amazing. It was amazing. Amazing. I felt really good about myself. Uh, yeah, it's, it's that thing. Uh, I also, on a very limited version of the story you told about, you know, going to the salsa dancing and, you know, like, taking those fears. Uh, I used to do this experiment. You ever go to the Minnesota state fair? You ever go up to Minnesota when you were younger to, to the state <laughs> no, fair? I, I, I went to uh, Southwest Minnesota state, but I never went to okay. the uh, well, fair there. State yeah. fair. You're missing out. It's amazing. They got sweet Martha's cookies. They're the best chocolate chip cookies you'll ever have. Good. And you, you, of course, it's a state fair, so you don't buy them by the cup or by the plate, you buy the Pound. bucket. Yeah. So the, the, yeah, it's like this It's like this giant bucket of cookies. And so I would make it a point because I was so afraid of getting rejected and, and talk, even talking to strangers. I would go and ask everybody with a bucket if I could have a cookie. And I was like, whenever I'd go to the fair, I'd ask them if I could get a cookie. Because it just, it like was a small thing that forced yeah, me to smart. face a little bit of that fear. Yeah. And, and then I got cookies. cookies. Yeah, exactly. People, I think like one person ever turned me down. I do this at like, college. Yeah. Um, like football games, when people are tailgating, I always do this because I'm like, I'm not going to go spend and buy like an $8 bratwurst uh -huh. or a hot dog. <laughs> Everyone's making their own burgers and hot dogs and people got so much uh -huh. stuff in their food that I'd just be like, hey, has anyone got a dog I can like, can I buy it for a dollar from you? And they'll usually just give it to you. Yeah. Like it's just put, it's risking people saying yep. no and the fear of humiliation for five seconds and then moving on. Mm -hmm. But the rewards are so much greater. And I always mm -hmm. use this line, like I just feel like I get upgraded on planes and hotels and free stuff all the time because I use this one line that has transformed my my last 10 years. And my friend Paul Evans told me this line 10 years ago. He said, anytime you want something, say, what's the chance that I could get a free hot dog? What's the chance you'd be willing to give me a cookie? What's the chance you can give me a free upgrade in this room? Whatever it is. And what's the chance? Every time I use that, it almost always works. What's the chance you could hook me up here? What's the chance you could That's do this good. for me? And it's just risking for someone to say no. But what if yeah. they say yes? Well, phrasing it that way is really smart. Because if, if you ask me, what's the chance, David, that you would sell my house for free? I would say it's not going to happen. But if that was something you wanted, here's a way that we could exactly. make sense of that. Right? It, it's You've experienced a small amount of rejection, but more importantly, you are going to receive what it would take to get there. And I think like Brandon, I can just picture you so much of your personality makes more sense after sharing that cookie story <laughs> because you're very hard to say no to. Like, oh, I think that it's getting beard. rejected a couple of times and not liking that sting caused you to respond by preparing ahead of time. Okay. If I make my voice sound like this, or I don't ask right away, I got to say something else first to get the conversation going. Then I'm going to bring it in. You naturally built up this way to connect with people because you don't want to get told no for this free cookie. And now it became a strength. I mean, I think that that's really brilliant that you guys mentioned that. Yeah. The cookie master. What are those cookies? All? Sweet, <laughs> sweet Mary's. Sweet Martha's. Sweet Martha's. Mm. Sweet Martha's. Yeah. Yeah, sweet out. Martha's. Yeah, they're they're by the bucket. They're amazing. All right, uh, let's let's jump down. I want to move on to a slightly different topic here uh, before we get you out of here. Um, I mean, you connect with a ton of big guests in your shows. I mean, like you got like so like I'm always just like in awe of like, oh man, Lewis is interviewing that person, and you were on Ellen. Like uh -huh. this, like that's amazing, right? I want to know like how you connect with these people. How are you? Like what, what, what do you do for networking? What's your tips for connecting with it? Cause this applies to people. You might want to be trying to connect with that local investor or that local TV station. You want to get some press for your company, whatever. Like what have you found has just been really helpful for networking? I, that's one of my skills, I guess, that I've been doing since I, in my LinkedIn days back in 2008, 2009 was I learned quickly how to message someone on LinkedIn and get a response because I was reaching out to like the successful leaders in like the Columbus area originally and first, no one was replying to me when I said, hey, can I pick your brain for 10 minutes? I'm a struggling person with no direction in my life and I need help. No one cared. But when I started to try different things and make it about them and make it about their success and do my research um, and figure out what is meaningful to them, then I started crafting my messages differently. So, for example, I'd always try to find three things that we had in common in the first sentence of any message. So I might say, okay, what do we have in common based on their LinkedIn profile? I see that they went to Ohio State. 
uh, and I see that um, they have an interest in salsa dancing and also that we have three mutual friends. I would use those three references in the beginning of the first sentence. Hey, I saw that you went to Ohio State, so did my brother, and I'm a big Ohio State Buckeye fan. Um, I see that you are you love salsa dancing as one of your interests. I've been dancing for three years. And that, uh, you know, um, Brandon, David, and Kevin are mutual friends. And Brandon said something really nice about you the other day when I talked to him about you. First line. It's like when you find three things that are mutual interests, people are automatically going to say, oh, I'm going to feel bad if I at least don't reply. Yeah. Okay, that's step one. Get them to be interested to then want to at least reply. Second p- sentence um, is all based on research. I really loved what you did in this. I really love this video you did here. I really love like how you went from this part of your career to the next part of your career. It's really inspiring. Something about them that is interesting to you about their success. And then the third thing for me is all about how can I serve them, not how can they serve me. So I would say early on, when I had nothing to give, I would say, I'd love to learn about your story of success and how you went from here to here. I'd love to hear that if you're willing to share with me five minutes about your story of success. Never in that three sentence email draft that I say, can you give me advice? Can you help me find a job? Can you help me do this? Can you invest in something? It was more about building a relationship and creating connection and trying to add value. Now that 10, 12 years ago when I had no value, it was, can you share your story of success? Because that was the only thing I could think of. But what I realized is with people when they've achieved something, most of the time, if you phrase it the right way, they want to tell their story of success. They want to tell you how smart I am, how I overcame this challenge, and why I'm so smart, essentially. We're like that we're fed by that kind of ego of like, oh, I appreciate you acknowledging that I've succeeded. You see me, you 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 hear me, let me share back with you. And I would get on the phone, or a lot of these people would meet me in person for coffee or something and give me 30, 60 minutes, and I would just sit there and hear them share their story. Never would I ask them for anything. Never would I ask for advice. But the way I phrased the questions, they would give me the advice that I needed based on them telling their success story. And at the end of it, I wouldn't ask for anything. And they would say, man, that was really, that was a fun conversation. Is there anything I can do for you? And I'd say, maybe I'd say, yeah, you know, I'm really looking for this and I'd love some support if you have it. But most of the time I would just say, no, I'm not looking for anything. But if I can connect you with anyone in the future, please let me know. And I would never, I still would never ask for anything. And I would kind of delay the ask for many, many years and just try to give, give, give. That's kind of been my last 12 year makeup is like never ask, always give and serve in some way possible. Uh, and giving might just be listening. You know, that's what might it be. And just saying, what's your biggest challenge right now? And them telling me, well, we're really struggling in our company with uh, finding a designer. And I'd say, okay, let me find you a designer and match them to you. Um, it's just all been, been about value. That's how I've connected with a lot of people. I'm also big on following up and following through. As an athlete, you, you, you score points in the follow through. And so getting someone like Kevin Hart on, I messaged his publicist every month for four and a half years. And it just happened to be the right timing. He had a self-help book that came out. And it made sense to come on the show then. It didn't make sense when he had all these other movies, but now it makes sense. But I kept showing up and adding value to the publicist. Uh, I try to do the best job I can in the interviews that they want to tell their friends. It's just a, a matter of showing up and adding value. As you grow, you know, as you get a bigger and bigger personal brand and more people know you, how do you balance your ego? You know, between like, oh, I'm so good, I did this really well. You know, ego. I'm sure you you probably read Ego is the Enemy or know of it, Ryan yeah, Holiday's yeah. book, right? So like, how do you balance that? I'm so great. I do things that that make me feel humiliated and, and take my ego down, um, whether it be intentionally or not intentionally, to remind myself I'm just a, <laughs> a human. Uh, yeah. I've got a girlfriend that will quickly bring me back to where I need to be if I have an ego. I've got family that will do that for me, my team. Um, I'm just constantly trying to be grateful and humble the best that I can, but also live in confidence and and, and kind of live in both worlds. But 
Yeah. I mean, social media will quickly bring you back down if you do something that people don't like and, and just trying to be like, okay, well, let me check myself and see if was that accurate? Should I have said that? Um, you know, do I believe in that or do I need to take ownership and responsibility and move forward in a different way? So, yeah. Is that yeah, one it's... of the things you've had to confront when it comes to what you're afraid of every year is actually becoming so successful that your ego gets out of hand? More of like my audience leaving me or whatever, or like judging mm. me, leaving me. Um, you know, we talked about this before we started. It's like, I like to bring on different interesting perspectives on my show. And sometimes people don't like that. And they think, mm -hmm. how dare you, Lewis, like ha elevate someone's voice who believes in this. But I'm always like, you know, if I don't take risks and I always play it safe, then where's the interest or the fun in that as well? And if I'm trying to have an intention to help people always, I feel like we need to have conversations with people that maybe don't believe in the same things. Mm -hmm. If we're trying to find connection and unity and healing, we've got to learn from different perspectives. And that's going to take me being the, essentially the facilitator or messenger or the personality curating conversations, taking the heat sometimes. And it's unfortunate when you see a bunch of people unfollow you in a day or leave a bunch of nasty comments or, you know, a couple of years ago, I went through a breakup uh, and the person I dated decided to say, well, here's all the things that Lewis did wrong and what he did and this and my feelings mm -hmm. on him publicly, which I thought wasn't really cool. But I – so I had to learn how to take heat from people judging without actually knowing the full story or actually mm -hmm. knowing the truth. They heard the truth from one person, and I never shared the truth, my truth. And But I just had to accept, okay, people are going to hate me, gossip, and judge me because they think something – whether it's true or not, and they don't know the context. And that's tough to not be able to kind of defend yourself, to be like, oh, people just assume this and they have no clue. But it was also like, okay, this is humbling. Uh, I get to like let go of all these needs to please everyone. I'm not going to be able to please everyone. So in some way, it gave me a sense of freedom, like going through this kind of an ego death of this person blasting me and shaming me about whatever because they were hurt and they can share whatever they want. But I had to let go of the need to everyone to like me, which was hard. Cause it's like, like you said, Brandon, we want everyone to like us and we're not intentionally trying to upset people. And when I've built goodwill in people and all I've tried to do is be positive for seven years, like, man, it's, it's tough. So going through, that was like a fear and, and going through it made me realize, okay, I'm okay. On the other side, I'm still alive. My business is here, and I've actually cut out people in my life that were taking so much energy from me that were fake friends who quickly judged me. Now I can focus my energy and attention on the people that I know are here for me, even if I made a mistake or something happens or people judge me. So it was actually a powerful experience that I want to take back. I guess is that probably unlocked pieces of your own talent that were being shoved down out of fear that if, if this comes out, people might see this or people might see that. And Absolutely. that was a whole new set of bats that you're going to have to confront when that Absolutely. Comes. I was definitely afraid of other people's opinions and needing to look good and needing people to like me. Yeah. And it, I still, I'm not trying to do things to get people to not like me. It's not like I intentionally want people to get mad at me, but I'm also going to stand for what I believe in and share my truth on things knowing that some people aren't going to like it and people are going to leave me and people are going to be upset and hurt by it. And um, it's unfortunate, but I'm not afraid to put myself out there as much anymore when I have, when I make certain decisions. You know, we're going to head over in a minute to over to the last segment of the show. It's called our famous four. But before we get there, is there anything like, I mean, there's probably, you know, roughly give or take a quarter million people listening right now to this. Like what, what do you need? What can our audience bring to you right now? Is there like your guests you're looking for or connections or anything that would just like benefit your life that maybe somebody out there could help you with? My, I mean, my top five list of guests since I first started, I mean, Will Smith and The Rock uh, and Jim Carrey have been in the top kind of five from the beginning. So if anyone knows, but I'm, I'm kind of close to the, their teams, but you know, Jim Carrey lives like a half mile from me out here. In really? Maui. Right. Yeah, it's yeah, funny well. because I moved into a building here in LA and 
like the next couple of weeks, I saw him in the building, and he was actually lived oh, in crazy. the top of the, uh, in the penthouse of the building I lived in. I think he's moved right now from there. But, but yeah, Jim Carrey. If anyone knows Jim Carrey, I'd love to interview him. I actually have talked to his publicist for years too. But if anyone has a closer connection, uh, The Rock has been on my my hit list since uh, seven years. I feel like we have a similar story from being kind of failed football players into building brands. Obviously, his brand's way bigger, but um. Uh, so those you'll, are, you'll catch him. You got this. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just I'm just here to serve people and um, and help people, but always looking for great guests. Very cool. Well, with that said, let's head over to the last segment of the show. It's our famous four, not the we fantastic four, the famous four. It's not the the famous four. Famous for it's uh, the part of the show where we ask the same four questions to every guest every week. Uh, we're just going to modify the first question slightly because it's a, normally a real estate related one. I normally ask what's your favorite real estate related book, but I want to actually go to like other resources. Like what are some like either podcasts or like, you know, how many, online how many people websites? say rich dad, poor dad. Yeah, oh, everybody yeah. said that. Everyone, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I said it. It's, it's a great book, but <laughs> it's like the book, yeah. Uh, but what, what, like, what resources do you rely on? We'll ask you other like business books here in a second, but in, just in terms of like uh, resources that have helped you a lot in your life, uh, what would you point people to? Business towards? resources? Any resources that you just think people should be checking out right now to benefit themselves? Monday.com, which is like a project management tool that we just started using mm. to help have all of our systems, processes, documents all in one place as opposed to what I did for almost 10 years of just having Google Docs spread out everywhere and yeah. managing it that way. So that's just the first thing that came to mind. That's top of mind. Yeah, it could be that. It could be like, you know, anything. A speaker Podcast you like, you to like A speaker to. you like, yeah. Uh, I really like listening to people that have kind of spiritual truth. Uh, I don't consider myself religious, but I – Love spiritual thought leaders who keep me grounded and keep me thinking of a bigger purpose and a mission for life. I'm interviewing this guy, Rob Bell, later this week, who I've had on. Oh, yeah. I know Rob I've Bell. I don't on, know him. I've but, had him on a few yeah. times, and he's yeah. a buddy of mine. And again, it's and here at top love, of mine. love Wins and yeah, exactly. Velvet Elvis. And yeah, yeah. He, yeah, I would, I just listened to his podcast is great. His books are great. If you just feel like you need some spiritual grounding in your life, no matter what religion you are, uh, he's great. I mean, Jay Shetty, I think, is great. He's got some good stuff on just keeping you grounded as well. I feel like a lot of us just need to continue to stay grounded in our on our mindset because yeah. with all the distractions, all the fear, anxiety, the most powerful thing we can do is take care of our mind and our thoughts. And, uh, you know, 84% of our thoughts on a daily basis are recurring thoughts, and most of those thoughts for most people are negative. Yeah. And so if we can learn how to reprogram the way we think – internally and start saying nicer things to ourselves and start having more belief in ourselves as opposed to saying, I'm never going to mount anything. This is going to fail. What if this goes wrong? What if all these things go right? And what if it goes bigger and better than anything we've ever imagined? What if we had those conversations with ourselves? So finding people like Rob Bell, Jay Shetty, who really give us tools to kind of stay in that mental uh, state of, of peace and calm, I think is the greatest enemy is like negative thought. And, um, it's what holds us back. So that would be a couple of people I'd recommend. And then yeah. maybe a, a book. I mean, I always go back to the alchemist. I don't read too many books all the way through, but the alchemist, I feel like is a great reminder for people to remember who they are and what their, what their mission is. So if this, one sentence mission statement resonated with you, I would say go back and read that book if you haven't read The Alchemist and give yourself the homework of writing down a one sentence mission statement in the next 24, 48 hours, messaging you guys on social media, or you can tag me at Lewis Howes on social media and sharing your one sentence mission because I believe that resource of you having focus and writing it up on your wall or putting it on your phone is going to make your life that much more amazing when you're clear on your mission. What about some of your favorite hobbies? Uh, salsa dancing is a big passion of mine. Uh, I also do acro yoga, even though I haven't done any of these activities in about a year and a half because of COVID and uh, other things. But acro yoga is where it's like partner yoga. And I like putting people on my hands, doing handstands in the air while I'm standing up, kind of like a acrobatic stuff. Um I'm a big basketball player, love basketball, but I'm really just a student of, of uh, my hobby every day is like studying people, mm. observing people, listening to people. 
and trying to become a master of human behavior because I feel like if we can understand why people are the way they are, then we can connect to them and we can both benefit in certain ways. So I'm always studying people. I watch a lot of movies. I feel like I, I get inspired through movies and it gives me a lot of creative ideas. So movies are hobbies too. All right. Well, my last question of the day, and then we'll let David uh, ask his last. What do you think separates successful people? If you had to kind of boil this down, I know we kind of asked this earlier, but if you could, like, what separates successful people from those who give up, they fail, or they just never get started? Obsession. I, I feel like uh, it's hard to fail when you're obsessed about something. And um, something I've done, I, I don't know if this is just part of my makeup or part of whatever, but I've, I'm like a bulldog. I'm just obsessively wanting to know the answer. I'm obsessively wanting to get the result and I'll do whatever it takes to make it happen. Uh, so for me, that obsession, I've, I've heard Conor McGregor talk about it. He's like, I'm just obsessed with the process. I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed. And I love it. Grant Cardone talks about being obsessed. Uh, I mean, I don't think you can achieve great results by not being obsessed, by dabbling, by trying to do everything by hitting the wall on every spot as opposed to like I'm going to drill in this one spot over and over again to break through the wall so some level of obsession on your craft and on your dreams uh, instead of dabbling I love that when you pair the strong intense desire to get good at something with the concentration of putting it all into one area, you become that laser yeah. that can drill right through whatever's in front of you, as opposed to the light bulb, which spreads its light everywhere, but it doesn't really get through obstacles. You know, that's at the other end of your success or before you get there is going to be some form of obstacle. And if you want to get through that. Yeah. I think uh, the, I think the books what essentialism where it's like, yeah. They show a circle of energy in every direction and it goes nowhere. And then a circle with like one arrow and it's going in one direction. So it's all the same concept. It's just focused energy. That's what you teach at the School of Greatness. That's right? it, man. Focused energy. I love that. That's awesome. All right, Lewis. Well, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom. It's not just your wisdom, but the collective wisdom of all these people that you've talked to that you brought in with us. You've been a bit of a laser yourself. And I really appreciate you for that. Can you tell us where our listeners can find out more about you? Yeah, Lewis Howes, anywhere online and School of Greatness podcast or on audio or YouTube. And yeah, just say hi. Very cool, man. Well, thank you. Awesome. Appreciate you a ton. And again, I've like, been looking up to you for years. So it's uh, great to finally connect and get you here on the show. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, I got I to gotta dive into more real estate in the future once I find the excitement and the interest in it. Because I don't think people yes. should dive in unless they're really curious and passionate about it. But uh one day when I'm at that next season of life, I'll be reaching out and saying, hey, what should, should I do? do? Should I do duplexes? Should I do renovations? <laughs> should I do commercial real estate? What should I do? And then I'll learn from That's you funny. guys. So You know what's funny? It's actually like, this is a true story. So back, I don't know, 10 years ago now, maybe 12 years ago, when I first got into like the world of like online, a little bit of education online, I started an old blog called Real Estate in Your 20s. And my like I remember my original goal was someday I wanted to be the guy that like, celebrities and podcasters and authors would go talk to when they want to know real like that wow. was the, that was the vision <clears throat> was the which vision. is funny today now now i get phone calls from people i'm like wow they're asking me about this podcast like they're asking yeah so how many kind of I'm, what's surreal. your guys restate portfolio what does it look like i'm at just under 40 single family homes for for my own personal portfolio wow and is that spread through a few states is that in one state is that yeah that's over five different states I wrote the first book I wrote for this company, Bigger Pockets Publishing, was called Long Distance Real Estate Investing. So nice. I was a police officer, worked a bunch of overtime, obsessed on that one thing, wow. saved up the money, the bought, bought the home. rental properties. Yep. And then just like what you said, I got good at that one thing and then I expanded out from there. I started wow. writing blog articles to teach people how to do it. That led to book deals, that led to teaching, that led to this podcast. Now I'm a real estate broker in California and I wow. help clients and do loans. How many did you buy uh, while you were still a cop, full time cop? 25. No it way. Painstakingly dude, dude, Lewis, grueling. You should hear, you should that's, hear David's. That's like, like frugal life. Every penny goes into <laughs> yes. like this $80,000. You should hear his story. More, yeah. His story is, his story is insane. Like he was like the work a hundred hours a week. You can buy 25 like, yeah. in whatever, 15, mm -hmm. 20 years as a cop with a, I don't know. I'm assuming you're only making 80 grand a year max, depending mm -hmm. on what city you're in. That's some like, you got to get creative. You got to find like, Oh, who, yeah. where do I get the loans from? Where do I do this? How do you know? How much of my money do I have to put down? So you're you're living yeah. proof that if you could do it, then then anyone could do it.
David's the picture of like focused energy on. on and your main thing is just done. like single family homes. Yeah, that's, that's what thing. I did. But see that that built into a business now where right, I help right, other right. people who I can help them buy properties and we can help do the loans. And your point was so smart that you you get really good at that thing and you expand out from there. And yeah. I just I know I've said that like five times, but for everyone that's listening, great. that is like the recipe for being successful. Just curious of those forty homes, how much in uh, cash every year does that bring in in income after? paying yeah. the 10% fees after the property taxes, after fixing the roofs and everything. That nets me right around a quarter million on the single family portfolio. But a, a lot of the wealth you build from real estate isn't just the cash flow that comes in. It's paying down the mortgages, the, the properties yeah. appreciating. So at a certain point, I will sell those, transfer those into like what Grant Cardone does. And that will probably go up to around a million a year in uh, in passive income that wow. the, the real estate generates for me. Yeah, and by the larger apartment complex that's exactly right. right the units yep that's yeah so real estate really get rich slow game yeah. it's it should yeah, be it boring is. and it should just be focused energy <laughs> drilling away you know like wow. like building a tunnel uh right through that mountain yeah you know? it's yep. almost like the first home even if you're like oh i'm making 435 dollars a month and uh and rental income after yep. expenses but at the end of the year you really don't because you got to fix everything yep. so it takes that's like exactly uh -huh. right it takes like that third or fourth home where you're like now i'm making 500 a month 700 a month yep. because i've refined the system yeah but 10 years in 15 years in that 400 is now a thousand or 1500 yeah. as inflation goes over and that it's like planting a tree that tree grows and it starts to put off a lot more fruit yeah get rich slow and what about you brandon yeah, I got uh, a couple dozen like smaller deals and then I got into the larger stuff. So I buy mostly mobile home parks today. So I think I have like 600 pads for mobile home parks. 600 lots. Like lots, yeah, with homes on them. Interesting. And, uh, Do you own a whole clothes, mobile yeah. park? Yeah, like we own the land and the whole thing and then people own their own homes and actually rent them out, which is a fascinating So you own the weird, land, you don't own any homes on the mobile side. We, yeah, we end up owning some homes just out of necessity because people leave and right. stuff. So yeah, it. yeah, we don't want so we want to be you're just the a, land. They just rent the land yeah yeah to put their home yeah yeah pretty much wow. which which is a, a yeah we, the which basically means they do their own repairs and maintenance which is one of the reasons that they stay forever that's nice their own home. yeah so that's you never nice. have to fix anything up that's another level that's like yeah, exactly I, why you went there because he doesn't well, like dealing with headaches because i don't like contractors and headaches like no but the, pay the, my land rent but you get less rent for the land right yes so yes like, you might like, get, it's like a couple hundred dollars a month it's not much per, but it's per like unit. not much not to deal with all the stress Exactly. And when you have six, you know, five, six, seven hundred of them. Well, he can it, scale uh, bigger because he's not dealing with the stress. So he can go 10 times bigger with the same work. Interesting. That's the idea. Well, the beautiful part about mobile home parks is the stories you get. Like we went to do a bank robber, actually Imagine. went and robbed a bank. That was amazing. We had a, 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 prostitute that wasn't actually a prostitute she was actually robbing people but who couldn't then report it because oh she was gosh. They were coming. oh my yeah, gosh yeah which is a true story so anyway those get those are fun that's, that's why we're mobile home what's parks. the vision that's for you brandon uh 2025 if you could have anything yeah. in real estate vision what would that be wow i love how you've you've you you're definitely an interviewer right you know how to turn this around this is this is fascinating uh oh really the true story this much longer story but i had a vision i said th uh, two years ago or a year and a half ago i said 50 million dollars in real estate by december 31st 2021 it's actually on my wall and a huge vision statement i'm big on vision stuff anyway and we're gonna hit that here in about two months from now uh, 50 so million now in like, real estate is that through the fund and everything? yeah i wanted to own yeah real, 50 million in real estate through the fund and so now it's like well what's the next level so uh we're kicking around i don't know like how ambitious do we want to be honestly that's depends that's the depends biggest question your, right now yeah it depends on your life uh -huh. Goals, it's I like, guess. Do you want to be Grant yeah, Cardone can, and keep exactly, 10xing every year, or do you want to like, oh, mm -hmm. I'm making a few million a year and I feel pretty good? And I really like surfing and I really like yeah. snorkeling and hanging out in Maui with my family and my kids. And so uh, I, I, currently it's 50 million a year is where I'm, I'm setting it at. We'll see if I'm going to 10x that, but I like 50 million a year is a good number. That's great. That's awesome. Yeah. What about you, yeah, the big, David? Yeah. Yeah, what are you doing, David? Uh, my like five years from now, my business goals are to have two businesses that make seven figures a month, and then probably about eight to nine other income streams. So that would be I'm a mortgage broker in California as well as a real estate broker. So building up my teams to where I'm doing wow. that, and then just basically funneling a hundred percent of that income into owning more real estate. More real estate. Wow. Yeah, and then my my role will just be to be the top real estate educator in the country. So I just teach everybody, this is how you do it. And then those businesses create the income that I can then put into deals. I can take those deals, make it a case study to teach people and kind of create like a self-sustaining ecosystem that just spins faster and faster as I grow. That's exciting, man. All right. Well, now I got to ask the same question to you, man. Where, where, where are you For headed? me, it's, 
impact 100 million lives a week and Oof, helping them live right. a better life. Um, that's five years out, but I'm also like trying to do it every year. I'm like, what yeah. would it take if I could, if I had to do it this year and I'm trying to accelerate it. Um, and a lot of it comes down to, it's hard to reach a hundred million people with, without video because mm -hmm. audio, as you guys have seen, it's hard to make a, a one piece of audio content pop and go viral. It's almost, I, yeah. I don't know if anyone's ever done it. Maybe it's like Joe yeah. Rogan or something with Elon Musk smoking weed or something like that. Yeah. That's about, that's but about, it's more like the yeah. video takes off and people watch the clips. So it's, it's really figuring out how do we build our own production company with viral video content that has the ability to reach 10 million people a week for each video so that we could collectively reach 100 million people with all of our content to help give people tools and inspiration to improve their life. So that's a... Uh, you need an amazing accent like Jay Shetty. Exactly. I mean, a British you, accent you that just makes that. you yeah, different you and that. unique. Like, <laughs> and trustworthy. Yeah, true. Exactly. You can say anything. You know, Australian or British, people will trust whatever yeah. you say. Exactly. <laughs> you guys are both really inspiring what you guys have created. I know your audiences uh, love your wisdom and your just down-to-earth mentality. So it's amazing to see a couple of guys, someone with a lisp who, who's to steal cookies in um, uh, Madison or St. Paul, Minnesota, wherever it was, <laughs> and, and a cop who can transform – uh, his own life and, and one day at a time, one house at a time, and then transition out of that and, and give back. So you guys have both done amazing things. It's really inspiring. Thanks, well, thanks man. If you ever want to get in touch with any of the guests we've had, we've had Jocko Willink, uh, Hal Elrod, yep. Tim I've Ferriss. Had, I've had all those guys. Yeah. Okay. Well, if yeah. you, but I'll look across, at your, I'll look at your list. There I'll you look go. at your we'll list, but I've had those three and... guys. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate you guys very much. Well, Thanks for having Gary me. Gary Vaynerchuk, have you had Gary yet? I've had Gary like three times, yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> I've, known Gary for, I've known Gary for 11 years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I saw a video of you guys back like way a long time ago recently. War in 2009, yeah. yeah. Yep, yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. All right, dude, well, thank you for coming on the show. We appreciate you a lot, so take care. Appreciate you guys. All right, and that was our show with... Lewis House, uh, awesome show. I knew that was going to be good. I've been looking forward to that for really months since uh, we started talking about trying to get Lewis on the show uh, and definitely did not disappoint. What do you think, David? Yeah, he was, like you said, he did not disappoint. I think that you know, if the goal of this was to say, okay, this is how you build wealth through real estate. Here's some things that may be stopping you from doing it. We could not have asked for a better guest or better yeah. content to just go right at the heart of this will often get in your own way when it comes to getting what you want out of life. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know, just, hey, everything that he talked about today, I'm like, to think, I'm like, man, that's just so good. I want to listen to that again. So very, very cool. I'm glad we got there. There's a lot more we didn't get to of his stories. If you guys want to like check out his story, like make sure you guys listen to his show, uh, listen to other interviews he's done, and maybe we'll bring him back here again sometime. We'll go deeper because uh, he's written some really good books as well, uh, like The Mask of Masculinity and The School of Greatness uh, and uh, just all around pretty well-rounded guy and if anybody can connect him with the rock let's do that as a community yeah please if anyone yeah. here knows the rock and can make a connection or oprah winfrey hey if you know oprah i don't think you'd mind that either i don't think so all right with that said david you want to get us out of here i'm going to go kayaking with uh mr ryan murdoch today well that sounds awesome yeah right, i mean if you were ryan here take some good pictures yeah if you were here you know we could kayak together if i was no. there i'd have to spend 14 days in quarantine and i would not be allowed to kayak <laughs> i would be we facetiming would, yes, with that's you true. <laughs> <laughs> we'd be out of the water it'd be great all right Thanks, Brandon. I appreciate you, man. This is David Green for Brandon, the Cookie Master Turner. Starting off. <laughs> was that a Cookie Monster voice or did I go Yoda? <laughs> that was Kermit the Frog, I think. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.